Kia ora tato, and uh, thank you for that introduction. This is a terrible space to be to follow that, that wonderful group. And I assure you I'll do none of, none of the what they were even trying to do. But we'll be fascinated nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very briefly. Uh, I want to, um, first of all, uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we stand, and I, I wish them best in all their struggles, of which there are obviously many in this, in this country. Uh, I also want to thank the um, Teachers Federation for the chance to um, speak here today. Um, this is very important for NZDI Te Roa that we uh, engage with, uh, not just with the Australian Education Union, but also the state, the state unions, uh, because the struggles we face are clearly uh, common across the, across the Tasman. And I particularly want to congratulate you on um, what I think I'm still allowed to call your Gonski campaign. OK, we'll stay with that. Uh, and, uh, and note the progress you made with your state government, and I, I desperately hope that that, um, that can be locked down before the election, such that um, whoever forms the next government can't uh, disrupt that. That's, that's a wonderful campaign deserving of the international prominence that it has. I also bring the greetings from our president, Judith Nowatarski, uh, to you. Uh, she. Uh, is a, an historical president for NZDI because she's in fact our first early childhood education president and that represents a significant um, step uh, for NZDI. I've been asked to talk about charter schools and uh, I'll talk a little about what they look like or are going to look like in New Zealand but I, I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about what we're actually going actually doing about charter schools because I find in lots of these forums we end up in a sort of um, a race for the bottom about who's got the worst form of, um, of these bad schools rather than talk about what it is that we've got to do about them. And I want to spend some time on that and, and I very much look forward to a dialogue or a debate with you about that. Firstly, the origin of uh, charter schools in New Zealand. They've just come in through that old fashioned germ uh, process that um, Parsi Salzburg has introduced. And in New Zealand, very much around an agenda of introducing choice, which we know sits very closely to competition, and on the back of competition is our old friend privatisation. And so very much around that agenda of choice, competition leading to privatisation, they've come in. The New Zealand school system is different from here, obviously, in that only 4% of uh, New Zealand compulsory system is private. So we have a very small private school sector. And that's meant for the advocates of competition and choice and privatisation. There's not the critical mass to produce that competition or that competitive uh, uh, system inside New Zealand when you've only got 4% of your schools are private. So clearly the government needed to find a new vehicle to introduce competition into New Zealand schooling. And quite clearly that's what charter schools do. Charter schools very much have that uh, role of introducing competition into New Zealand and in introducing through that uh, privatisation. And l as we tell our members, uh, you don't have to privatise every school uh, to get the effects of privatisation ha and competition happening throughout the system. It's that uh, old phrase, you just have to produce competition at the margins. And that's what charter schools are designed to do in New Zealand. How did they come in? Uh, prior to the last election, uh, the Nats, we, a national party we know, were doing some work through Treasury around charter schools. It didn't come through in the National Party ele election manifesto. They didn't appear in that. The only place they appeared was in the ACT Party, which is made up of the rump of the 1987 Labor government, uh, the very far right wing government in New Zealand. And the first we heard of them, technically heard of them, was in the context of a coalition deal done between the National Party and the ACT Party, the now controversial teapot deal, because it was done over a cup of tea, made with a now a very discredited politician called John Banks, who's the only uh, politician left in the ACT Party. And he's the guy who um, took $50,000 off um, Kim.com uh, got it into two $25,000 tranches when he was standing for mayor and completely forgot about it. 
What, what was more interesting about John Banks, he flew a helicopter out to two lots of parties at Kim.com's uh, mega upload mansion and seemed to have forgotten about that as well, as he claimed he didn't know this bloke. And if you've seen a picture at Kim.com, he's massive. <laughs> so that's the sort of discredited politician we're, we're dealing with who brought this in in a very carefully contrived plan by the National Party to get charter schools into New Zealand. And it appeared in the coalition deal with a focus on uh, disadvantaged areas, Christchurch and South Auckland. Now, this was very, uh, uh, this was very much a wake-up call to the folk of Christchurch and South Auckland that they were disadvantaged and failing communities. Uh, it was brought in, allegedly, to lift the long tail of failure in the New Zealand education system for Māori and Pasifika. They set up a working group with the chair from the ACT Party uh, to run it. The legislation went into the House in March. It was passed a couple of weeks ago. And 2014, we're going to have charter schools in New Zealand. And I'm going to talk more about that later. So what, what are charter schools in New Zealand? What are they going to look like? Well, we were told that we're going to not have that US version that Karen's going to talk about. We're going to have a, a New Zealand version of charter schools, a customised version to deal with the problems of the New Zealand education system. What we've got is a straight down the line US version. We've got uh, the, the owners of charter schools can be profit or not for profit. They're going to have unqualified teachers. They don't have to teach to the curriculum, only the principles of it. They will be subject to national standards, and there's another speech in itself. They, they will not be subject to the Official Information Act. They have juiced up funding. In, um, in other words, they're funded at Decile 3, which is at the lower end, rather than at any other area, which means immediately puts them at a competitive advantage. Uh, they don't have to obviously be part of the collective agreement and uh, they will have non-teaching uh, principles, the, the executive principle notion, and uh, ballots if there are overflows. And, and so it goes on. I don't want to bore you with the detail. You'll hear more about that later. Applications are now being sought, and the first um, indicative applications, predictably, and this is what's happened in, in, in other overseas countries, have come from uh, what were typically regarded as education fringe groups. Uh, the focus on Christchurch and South Auckland is now gone. They want as many as possible. Uh, they've made an, a special uh, emphasis on Māori and Pasifika. And uh, most galling of all to our schools is there will be no notice to the community when they're introduced, as there has to be now. So basically, one will wake up one day and find out we've got a charter school in, in our local community. So, that, that's pretty much straight down the line, charter schools. What's, what's our response to that? What's NZDI's response to that? First of all, we needed to take a deep breath. We needed to be strategic about this and not walk into the obvious traps that were being set for us. And we developed a strategic framework to deal with them, and I'll outline that. And it, it's very simple, as, any, as these frameworks need to be. Firstly, our goal, very simple, get rid of them. Secondly, what was our key strategy? And the key strategy is to make them the wacky fringe of education so an incoming government has got the political space, the political wriggle room to get rid of them. So we have to marginalise them, keep them out there. And to do this, we have to shift the politics. And that's twofold, as we know, and you, you people know, we've got to get rid of the existing government and we've got to make sure an incoming a probably Labor Green coalition government will get rid of them. And as you know yourself, you can't pay attention to one side of that coin without paying attention to the other side. And our key message, it's very simple, why? We just keep saying why. Where is the evidence that charter schools anywhere lift system performance? Now, we say why rather than saying no. Quite clearly, it's a dog whistle for no. But we say why uh, for the simple reason that it puts the other side on the back foot to justify it. And also enables us to avoid the choice issue, because that choice issue is the framing that they use back at us. So our framing is, is threefold. 
We, we say our framing is it's a discredited idea promoted by a discredited deal with discredited politicians. And every time John Banks appears in the district court defending his charges of um, illegal electoral funding for his mayoralty back in Auckland a number of years ago, we hop on that discredited politician uh, bandwagon. Secondly, we say it's dangerous for children's learning. That's the unqualified teacher piece. And thirdly, privatisation. So we join up those, those spaces. So that's our strategic framework. So what are we doing about it? This, this, we've got two phases in this campaign. The first phase has been from the introduction of the concept through to the legislation passing a couple of weeks ago. And within that, we have engaged with the working group and we've said why. And it's really interesting because the working group never had an answer to that question. And in fact, when pressed, they would say to us, why don't we just give it a go? I kid you not. Why don't we just give it a go? Our media and our publicity is obviously around the why. Our allies are plenty, uh, and we've engaged with them. And in this space, there's a really carved out area for special needs, because overseas, uh, the private charter schools have avoided special needs for the obvious reasons. And uh, indeed, as Karen will talk about in New Orleans, that's been one particular area that the proponents of charter schools have struggled with, is in the special needs area. Uh, and obviously there's, there's lots of academics on our sides. In the, on the political uh, stage in phase one, we turned our minds to getting Labor and the Greens and New Zealand first to commit against charter schools, and that wasn't easy. Uh, uh, for some parts of Labor, it was, yeah, that was a bit of why don't we give it a go. The Greens were a lot better, but were unshaped. And at the third party that we need to turn New Zealand first, which is run by someone you may know called Winston Peters, they were actually probably one of the strongest. We needed to shift the other parties inside the, net, the governing coalition. Uh, obviously, we weren't going to shift the Nats and act, but who else could we move? Uh, we engaged a round of public meetings, particularly in Christchurch and South Auckland. And it's interesting in Christchurch that um, the way the government have tried to capitalise on the crisis following the earthquake there is two of the schools they pretended to, uh, wanted to close were Kura, the Māori immersion schools. They wanted to close two and have them all move into one site. And they wanted that other site for a charter school site. Now, uh, because of the backlash from the Māori communi community in Christchurch, um, they are keeping both those sites open, but the minister has not ruled out using closed school sites for charter schools. The, and we've also worked with iwi, the, the Māori tribal groups, and in fact uh, have moved a number of, uh, in that phase, a number of those iwi leaders to say they did not want charter schools for their uh, members of those tribal groups. Uh, and most importantly, of course, we had to work with our own membership and make them aware of the dangers that were posed by this. And our biggest danger, I'd have to say, in our membership base is entrepreneurial principles. And that's most unfortunate because on the other side, our strongest advocates against charter schools are our principles. But I have to say, um, we are already he hearing murmurings from um, some of the uh, obvious candidates. On the other side in phase one, the promoters of charter schools, uh, what did they say? They talked about the individual successes of individual charter schools in the states. Uh, they continued to use the government framing about the failing New Zealand education system. The give it a go phrase I talked about before, they imported Mike Feinberg the founder of the KIPP school movement in the States, and he came out and, um, uh, uh, I can't say the word, um, pushed uh, charter schools uh, very strongly. And uh, indeed, one of the areas that's often forgotten around charter schools is support staff, because everyone focuses on the teachers and principals, and I understand that, I get that space, but we've got to remember our support staff. So I asked Feinberg, I said, what's the story with support staff in charter schools in the States, in his schools? And he said, the, the, Paul, he said, the good thing is we've got less of them. <laughs> because we put that money into teachers. Like. <laughs> <laughs> or as we say, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and obviously they have got um, groups of Māori and Pacific Island uh, proponents for, uh, for charter schools. And in particular, they have worked on the Māori Party, which to its eternal shame went into coalition with the national government. And uh, we have been able, unable to move the Māori Party around this, even though Peter Sharples, who was one of the pioneers of the, um, uh, the Kura movement inside New Zealand, actually told us that he didn't support them. But the Nats put the whip over them and they've just voted this straight, straight down the line. And so that's the line the other side ran. In phase two, which is basically now through to the next election, uh, we had to deal with the introduction of the legislation. It got over the line by one vote. So we turned them all by the, uh, the Māori party, who didn't even turn up in the House the times it went through. To their shame, their party didn't even turn up for something that will destroy Māori learning and Pacifica learning in our country. We, we can't, uh, we've tried to get the list of applicants. We haven't been able to do that uh, through Official Information Act requests, uh, but there are some indicative ones. And as I say, they'd be the usual groups that you would think, think so. So in phase two, we've continued to question why our, uh, and our political work with the Labour and the Greens has been most successful. The Labour Party has said there will be no place for them in New Zealand's education system. Uh, the Greens likewise. We've, we're probably a little cynical about politics, um, so we're now asking them to commit to abolishing them within the first 100 days of them being in government, and we're drafting up the legislation to get them to do that. We want to see it in that 100-day uh, proposal. We uh, also need to do that with New Zealand first. Uh, our iwi, uh, we have a number of them on side, but we still have the problems with um, subgroups. Our allies' work will continue. We have tried legally to investigate a judicial review to stop the legislation, uh, or to stop the implementation of the legislation more technically. That doesn't look possible, uh, so we've moved to that 100-day um, position. Let's talk on organising. This will be very, very quick. Sorry, we, we can give you an extension, but I'll yep. just have to ask them to Please. give you an extension. Um, conference, uh, up to 10-minute extension is available. That's been moved by Steve Armand and seconded by Julie Moon. I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Against, declare it carried. Thanks, Paul. Thank You've you got very 10 much. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, I get worked up about this stuff. <laughs> and rightfully so. <laughs> um, well, the last piece is really about organising. Um, once they're in, what do we do about them? And there's, there's two, two parts of that. Um, firstly, where there are existing schools that are looking to be um, uh, switched over, uh, our strategy there is to wrap the community around those schools. Uh, and we think that's the best way to take on those um, entrepreneurial uh, principles and maybe uh, the chairs of those um, boards of trustees. Uh, we need to work out uh, what are those at-risk schools, work with the boards of trustees, the staff and the community around that aspect. You don't need to do this. In organising the new school and looking at the new schools, again, we need to focus on the communities where they're going to be um, rammed into. Uh, th there is a difficulty there because they're very sectional interests like Christian groups or uh, Pacific Island Christian groups. That's very hard organising to try and deal with. And uh, the difficulty also is we send contradictory messages to the staff inside those new schools because on one hand we're saying um, we don't want your schools, on the next hand we're going to say you should be needing to join NZDI Aotearoa. So that contradiction in messages is something we're going to need to have to deal with. In terms of getting out um, to organise them, uh, we, we want the goal there is to bring them under either our collective, the big public collective agreement, or their own that mirrors the public collective agreement. That's going to be very difficult. We're looking for overseas experience with this. This is where Education International comes in, and it's all net very, very important that the, that the unions around the world that are confronting this issue actually talk to each other. That's a new idea and share our experiences. That's probably even more original. And lastly, how, how are we going? Well, in terms of shifting the politics, I've talked about that. There's one vote in it. Uh, in terms of making them wacky, I'd say we're probably winning that battle. Uh, and it's interesting, the language. 
Uh, inside the legislation, they're called partner schools, but the language is still charter schools. And that's really important language to keep in front of people. Uh, our members are obviously totally on side. Uh, there's a widespread rejection. We poll this about unqualified teachers, that's predictable. But they're actually trying to change the Teachers Council in New Zealand at the same time and introducing a new, quali quali a new category called AITS, Advanced um, uh, Authority to Teach, uh, which will enable unqualified teachers to get some sort of registration. Uh, and when they're established, we have to organise these places. Because at the end of the day, our view is there's still teachers and support staff in there, and they need to be protected and their professional voice listened to. And we, that's the way we will organise them. So the situation, I'll leave this with you, is we've won some battles, but we're still to win the war. Thank you for the opportunity to speak.